Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for attending our meeting about uh, soil salinity. Um, we've got a, a nice uh, lineup of speakers today and some information I think you'll find valuable. Um, again, at the end uh, of my presentation, I'll have some contact information so that you won't uh, be left out without uh, any contact uh, that way. So we're gonna get started. We don't wanna take a big part of your day. We really appreciate your time. Um, uh, wanna introduce to you Jim Ristow. He's the Sustainability Director for South Dakota Corn. And uh, Jim is gonna talk about the saline uh, soil issue and, uh, and show you his presentation. Go ahead. Hey everyone. Uh, thank you. We're, we're experiencing a little bit of uh, internet instability for some reason. But I wanted to start out uh, introducing Evan Howell. Uh, he works for Agtegra and he wants to say a few words. Hi everybody. Um, so some of the things I've been working on in kind of correlation with uh, every acre counts is analyzing uh, company-wide our soil test results and then applying um, some formulas provided by Anthony and uh, Cheryl Reese. And we've come up with some very large amount of acres in our system that would potentially, that are severely yield limiting for both sodic and saline and sodic saline situations. Um, I've got that broken down by farmers. So if there's any farmers out there um, who had, have had Integra soil sample with us, uh, chances are in 2019 we'll have it. Um, my plan is when the soil sampling season ends this year uh, to re-go re through the whole, whole list again and find even more because we've been dry up in the northeast part of South Dakota here and uh, some of these low spots where we tend to have all these issues are now actually getting sampled for the first time in a couple years. So I feel that number, we ended up with about 27,000 acres company-wide of severely limited yield potential because of salt issues. Um, I see that number probably going up now that we're sampling more areas with salt issues. Um, a few cool things I've seen out in the field is uh, we've been running some data loggers out there and they're uh, they're an EM38 unit. They, use, they give the same exact reading as a ferris cart, um, except there's no soil, con, soil con, or equipment to soil contact. So it allows us to run a little longer in the season and it allows us to uh, get over some wetter ground that we couldn't do before. And uh, I was running that for a few months and in areas with perennial forage strips around say like a slough, the salt content was deep in the soil profile, like close to a meter or three, roughly three feet. And the top foot and a half was a much lower reading. And then when I pulled out, you know, we're, we're taking 60 foot swaths. So I would pull 60 feet out into the field and then start recording the data. And it was it was flip flopped. the The shallow reading was sky high, the EC value was sky high, meaning there was a lot of salts, and then the 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 deep reading was very low, meaning that all of our salts in the area where we're trying to farm are in the top where our plants are trying to grow, and where we've established some of these areas of permanent vegetation, the salts have actually gone down lower into the profile. Um, so that's just a couple observations I've made um, and maybe get some thoughts going for the rest of the meeting. But uh, if you have any other questions about the program or any um, soil test data that I've come across, just shoot me an email at evan.howell at integra.com. Thanks, Evan. Are, are we coming across loud and clear? Yes, Jim, I can hear you really well. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna go into my presentation. It's kind of why are we seeing this salinity issue in South Dakota? 
uh, and and uh, the reasons, and and what can we get begin to do about it. Uh, Again, my name's Jim Ristow. I'm the Director of Sustainability for South Dakota Corn, which is a partnership with NRCS. And my job is to encourage farmers to, to uh, embrace better practices on the land. Uh, largely, this is revolving around soil health. Issues like salinity, of course, fall into that. We're, we're really trying to just make sure that our soils function as they're, they're intended or are capable of at their maximum. Uh, the geography in South Dakota is interesting. Uh, you can get into a long discussion about why that is, but uh, in a nutshell, uh, our, our uh, soils were built on an old seabed, an old saltwater lake, and uh, it laid down a lot of sediments, and, and this is what is called the pier shale. Uh, so this is the geology of the state. We have uh, the shale layer fairly close to the surface in a lot of places, and particularly the James River. Uh, and, and here's kind of a map that NRCS put together of where we really have to be concerned about this issue and how we manage our soils and the production practices that we're using. And as you can see, the James River Valley uh, is, is a, a big chunk of it. Uh, currently, there's estimates that we're seeing as many as 2 million acres that are experiencing impact from this salinity issue. So this is a big, big deal. Uh, you know, the state cannot afford to lose production on 2 million acres. So it's something we got to pay attention to and begin to address. Um, this is uh, a little bit of information, probably more than you want, but it's a typical saline or sodic site. There's, there's salts fairly close to the surface and there's a water table. So the commonality between saline and sodic problems is a high water table. And uh, there's some reasons for that, uh, but this is kind of how this is expressed on the landscape. You know, it looks like the moon, nothing's gonna grow there until we change something. Uh, these, these areas are getting worse. Problem is expanding in some cases. And, and this is maybe a little better description of a traditional saline seep where water goes in at a higher elevation, goes into the soils, hits an impermeable layer, and comes out somewhere lower on the landscape. And of course, along with that is these dissolved salts. And as the water evaporates, those salts are being left on the surface. Uh, so the number one reason is geology. And, and we live here. I, I love living here. I hope you love living here. We make our living here. But there's some issues with our soils in places we just have to be aware of. And there's not a whole lot we can do about that unless you want to move. But I like it here. The, uh, the other, another uh, factor that's playing into this is an increase in rainfall, uh, particularly more recently when talking climate. Um, this is documented. This, this is a, a U.S. geological survey um, from Scotland of the James River. And, and you look at the flow. This is a, a measure of the flow and, and the in the year. So there's a lot of water leaving our state, more than there used to be. Uh, rainfall can you can attribute to part of that. Uh, and, and of course, we have records that would indicate that. But another thing that's happening more recently, and this is a prediction model that was done by the National Weather Service. But as, as our climate changes in our in our particular area we're getting more intense rainfall events at times of the year when nothing's using the water so you think about this that's more early spring and again in the fall after harvest and then yet a, a drier winter and a drier summer so in a what this results in is 
a kind of an inefficiency in our water use with our crops that we're growing and, and the times of year that the water is needed. And if it's not being used or needed, or the, if the soils can't hold anymore, it's gonna result in runoff. So that kind of explains some of these reasons for these higher lakes that we're seeing. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, just an overall seemingly higher water table that is, is being seen. So the third thing that impacts uh, this salinity issue is our management. And that's really the only thing we can do anything about. Uh, and, and in management, we're talking about crop rotations. We're talking about tillage. Uh, we're talking about those soil health practices that have an impact. This is a map of South Dakota. Of course, the yellow is corn, the green is soybeans. And in a good share of the state, we're at about a 50-50. Uh, the middle yellow there out by pier is sunflowers, but the rest of that yellow is corn. So we're basically in a, a corn soybean agronomy in the in, a, in South Dakota, and uh, and then which uh, of these rotations is using more water? Well, none of them are really holding a candle to what the native prairie used to hold or used to use. I should use, use the word use. We had plants on the landscape growing year round in most, or, or at least at least during the growing season, and it better matched the climate. Dwayne Beck has talked a lot about this, of matching our crop systems to the climate that we have. And it really boils down to which rotations are gonna work. Tillage is something that is often seen. I, I've seen a lot of that this fall. I'm sure lots of you have. It seems to be, uh, you know, in theory, drying out those soils so that we can get in there and plant. But in in a sense, I think long term we may be actually making the problem worse because as the area is left exposed and unprotected, it dries out. The water tries to evaporate there again, leaving salts. So it, it's probably better to leave some residue that those soils are actually trying to heal by having plants growing in them. And that, that's how it works. Uh, this is a little bit of a time thing. You can see here, you know, a salinity issue. Then at some point this corner was farmed up uh, and, and the salinity issue just continued if not got worse and then it leads to issues and you know there's really no productivity happening there and in fact uh, the erosion is taking uh, you know soils away from the land or good soil so this is maybe a better uh, picture of what we should be looking for you know up in the upper right hand corner is uh, a pretty nice looking soybean field that looks nice and healthy, but yet look how much dark soil exposed, wind, rain, the elements, as opposed to these other systems where we're leaving residue on the surface, keeping that soil cooler and keeping more water in that soil and more plant available through the heat of the summer when the plant needs it. Uh, I, I think if we're going to grow soybeans, we're just really going to have to explore these types of systems to keep the residue on the land. The um, NRCS and SDSU have done a lot of work on trying to study this salinity issue. And uh, there are things we can do. I'm sure the question that comes up is, can we tile these areas? And uh, in some cases, possibly yes, there's been some success, but in other cases, we have to be really careful and it's where we have the sodium as an issue. And the theory is that as we increase drainage, some of these uh, other uh, nutrients leave before the sodium actually leaving a higher concentration of sodium 
which can lead to dispersion of the soil, which is really the, the soil structure just falls apart. And, and I'm sure you've seen that where, you know, water won't even go through it anymore. And at that point, it's, it's really uh, pretty much over. There's very little that can be done with that soil. And uh, it, it's hard to rebuild soil structure if you can't get a plant to grow at all. So what I'm really leading to here is the, uh, the opportunity, I guess, or encouraging people to consider uh, establishment of perennial vegetation on these sites to begin to reverse this, keep the water level lower, crops such as alfalfa do a good job of that, and, and just get some plants growing in these areas. Even if we hay them or graze them, uh, it's better than a bare exposed soil. Uh, and, and that's what nature would do if we just left it alone, it would cover itself. And, and really what I'm talking about is these principles of soil health that uh, help get you going in the right direction. Again, minimizing disturbance, keep a living root in the soil as much as we can, match what the climate does in our area with the vegetation that would grow here, or better describe, match the vegetation with our climate. And keep the soil covered at all times. Just, it's so important to limit the uh, the issues that hard rainfall, temperatures, heat, wind, uh, it needs that protection. Species of diversity is important because that encourages a microbial activity that is missing otherwise. Without vegetation, there's nothing happening in these sites microbially and really that is ultimately what is gonna get you back on track. And of course, livestock is part of that diversity to help encourage a, a lively biological community. And if you wanna learn more about this, uh, I encourage you to seek out this publication recently put out by the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition. Very insightful on these soil health principles and how to incorporate them into your operation. Um, with that, I think I'm going to pass it back to Aunt, uh, to Kent Vlieger, I guess, is next on the list. And, and thank you very much. Kent? Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you give me a thumbs up, Jim? Someone? Yes, I can hear you just good. Great, Kent. Okay, can great. you share your screen? Uh, yep, I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Then tell us a little bit about yourself, or if you want yep. me to do that, I can, but. Yep, yep, sure will. Let me get my screen shared here, and then I'll start off. Okay, so. Um, yeah, great to have everyone on for uh, an important topic here this morning. Um, my name is Kent Vlieger, and I'm the State Soil Health Specialist with the NRCS here in South Dakota. And um, prior to my current position, I worked in the field office for 16 or 17 years, um, and most of that here in South Dakota in the James River Valley. And so the salinity and sodicity topic is kind of near and dear to me. Um, just because I've seen so many acres and producers that have been affected by it. So um, Jim gave a great presentation on really kind of what we're dealing with and why it's here and some of the things that we can do to bring our acres back into production if they're affected by these salts and sodicity. And what I'm going to do for you today is go over a, an example of a pretty typical farm that's in the James River Valley. And we're going to discuss some numbers um, and then just do a quick rehash or review of what Jim discussed, what we can do to restore these acres. So as I'm going through these slides, keep in mind as I'm talking numbers, they may not exactly match uh, the economics or the numbers you use on your farm or that you get with your uh, crop rotations. Um, but these are the numbers that we've got with this, with this producer. And 
they don't exactly match yours. So I, I promise that the end result probably does match yours and that if you've got these saline acres, um, you're, you're losing money more than likely on them. So I'm gonna go over um, just a real quick uh, fact sheet that my predecessor, Jeff Hemingway, uh, came up with numbers on here several years ago. And this is kind of what got my interest peaked in the economics of this of salinity and sodicity, especially in the James River Valley. And what Jeff did is he came up with um, some numbers for kind of the upper James River Valley in South Dakota. So that would be Brown, Spink, and Beetle counties, two pretty large counties, um, all three of them dominated by uh, row crop production with a little bit of grassland. Um, but the numbers he used um, are all based off of the final number he came up with of an economic impact of a little over $26 million impact in that tri-county area it was based off of straight grain sales of uh, corn, soybean, and wheat. And so that's the economic impact. Uh, that's the loss of sales um, and, yield and yield loss. And so I, I knew that's a big number, $26 million over three counties. Um, but as I started to dig a little bit deeper into it, I thought maybe that's, that's not telling the whole story. And what I'm gonna do for you today is show that the actual economic impact to an individual producer's pocketbook is, is quite a bit more extensive than this $26.2 million spread over three counties. Okay, so this is the field we're gonna look at today. And pretty typical again for, for the James River Valley. Um, the image you're looking at here is from 2006 and you can see uh, some bale rows still sitting out there. And so this field for a long time had been used for, for hay production. It was a perennial crop and it was hayed every single year. And this was the last year that it was in, um, uh, in hay production. So after that, it was moved into row crop production. So this is an image of 2010. You'll see highlighted there uh, with that yellow uh, polygon. And you'll notice that looks pretty typical. You don't really see too many salt affected areas, not obviously on this aerial imagery quite yet. Um, and so if we advance to two years later, 2012, uh, which would have been a little bit obviously drier year um, for this part of the world, you can start to see some of those areas that are salt affected next to the to that creek that runs there and then kind of in the southwest corner and then the southeast corner you start to see some areas where it's just starting to show up um, where it's pretty obvious that there's something going on with those soils and as we advance to 2014 you can really start to see those areas that are salt affected they're really on the on the aerial imagery they're really quite white and um, really nothing being produced on many of those acres and this will be the final year of imagery that we'll look at. 2016, um, even more of those areas are starting to show up as, as salt affected. And so this is kind of how the issue sneaks up on a producer. One year you've got acres you're able to plant through and get a, get a crop off of and make some money off of. And then, you know, 10 years later, it just kind of slowly creeps up on you where, man, why can't I produce anything on those acres? And so this is a yield map from 2018 and pretty typical um, yield production for, for James River Valley. Um, you'll see you've got lots of areas of, of green, which is good. That's a, in this case, it's 190 bushels per acre plus. And then it goes all the way down to that rust colored red, which was under 100 bushels per acre. Um, in this case, it's gonna be, we'll talk about those acres are, those numbers are actually lower for bushels per acre. And then you'll see a lot of, or several smaller areas, if you can, if you can see them where there's no yield being produced. And so that's pretty typical for, for a quarter in the James River Valley. Okay, so this starts talking about the, the yield and the soils that are out there. Um, you'll look and you'll see soils that are pretty typical. You've got ham vanilla, which are nice loams. And then you've got um, this blend in fine sandy loam, which is um, can be productive, but in drought years is um, not quite as productive. And then you got some of these Durstein type soils, which would be the soils next to uh, the creek. And those areas, those types of soils in my production should very rarely, if ever, be cropped and should probably let the native vegetation just because they're so prone 
to those, those salts getting back to the surface. Okay, so if you look at this, you'll see that I've got the areas that are um, identified as being salt affected on this field. And those are the major areas. There's smaller areas throughout, but we're gonna focus on these that are circled with the yellow oval and circles. And those are the areas major identified. Um, you can also see those are the areas that are most um, dinged by yield where they have very low yields. Uh, there is an area where you can see that I don't have circled that's orange and red, but that's that um, sandy, it's a sandy ridge and just took a yield hit on that area that year, just didn't get the time to rainfalls. Um, but we'll start talking some numbers on these areas. So if you remember from the previous slide, this is a 116 acre field. And just so happens that 16 acres um, are identified as being salt affected. And so that's 16 acres. Um, you know, and, and when you think about it, 16 acres doesn't seem like much on, on that on a, on a field that size, but really it's greater, you know, it's, it's in that 10 to 15% range of soils that are affected. And so the average uh, yield on this field was 182 bushels per acre. And that's a total bushel production of 21,239. So that's the total that's harvested off of this entire field. So the whole field was planted all fields fertilize, all those inputs that we all know about went into producing corn on all these acres. Uh, eight of these acres produced zero yield. So they were planted, they had all the typical treatments for corn, um, but they produced nothing. Zero production on those acres. If we were to just take those eight acres out of production, uh, which I'm not advocating for as we'll talk about, but if we were to just take those eight acres out of production, the average yield on that field would go up to 195 bushels an acre, 195.4 bushels per acre, or a 7.4% increase. So that's just taking those acres out. That's what they didn't turn a tractor tire on them. No planting, no sprayer, no combine, none of the inputs gone into them. Um, another eight acres produced 50 bushels or less in yield, which is certainly not economical. Um, now you're not gonna make money off of those acres either. So if you take those additional eight acres out uh, where they produce 50 bushels or an acre or less, um, then the average yield goes up to $207 an acre. And that's a 13.7% 13, 13 increase. So you can see by taking those 16 acres out of production that it's actually money in the pocket more for that producer, even though he's not, not producing anything on those acres. So if you take those acres out and produce nothing on them, then your total uh, production for that whole field goes to 20,845 bushels per acre, per acre produced, or 20,845 bushels produced, which is less than the total if they farmed everything, but it's only 400 bushels less. Um, so if you factor in equ um, equipment costs, land costs, seed costs, fertilizer costs, um, all those things that you factor in when you're producing on any particular field, um, it really kind of starts to show. And if, if you look at this, there was a net of 17,575 bushels or $17,575 on this entire field. And that's money made. Most producers would say, well, I made some money on that field. Um, that might be fine for, for this particular year. But if you took out those 16 acres that were salt affected, the net goes up to $23,455. And so that's actually $5,880 more by producing on less acres. So you start to see if we can start to talk economics with producers, which I think most of them know, uh, most producers are able to produce yield maps. Most of them really figure out dollars that are made down to particular acres or grids or fields. Uh, most producers know that those acres are not producing. Um, so what do we do about that? Um, I'm one that's fully in the camp that we need to put native, ver native or perennial vegetation out there to restore these acres. Jim talked about that. Um, it's the best way, in my opinion, to restore these acres and make them productive again. Um, but that costs money too. And so if we look at a pretty expensive native or a vegetation mix that's salt tolerant, um, that's also productive, um, and an example I use is a mix of alfalfa, a saline tolerant alfalfa, and then a salt tolerant wheatgrass um, of 15 bushels an acre of those two. Um, so the cost for the seed and cost to plant it um, 
runs to $115 an acre. So that's 2,240 bush dollars, for example, in this field to restore. And if you remember, we saved five, over $5,800 by not planting those. So really, is it a cost to the producer? Um, in my opinion, no, they're actually still money ahead by planting these acres to grass. Um, and we know that those grasses and perennial vegetation are gonna help restore them back to productivity. Um, so those are just some numbers and an example that we can use to extrapolate out. And that's what I did again. So you remember my predecessor at three counties and said it was in the 20, uh, $26 million range of an economic loss. Um, but what I did is I took a pretty conservative approach and estimated there'd be $10,000 per section lost in those tri-counties, the Brown, Spink, and Beetle. And so that equates out to a $45 million economic direct uh, hit to producers' pocketbooks. Um, FSA data gives me that there's 2,300 producers in those counties total. And if you take that out to an average, that's each producer losing $19,565 on their saline acre. So that's a big hit. That's almost $20,000 worth of profit that's gone. And I'm being pretty conservative. I really think um, it's probably more. So Jim talked about uh, what we can do to restore those acres and he nailed it on the head. We minimize disturbance. And if we minimize disturbance, uh, the reason we do that is because anytime we're telling the soil, it increases evaporation and decreases infiltration, both of which are things we need to do to restore these soils. Keep the soil covered, plant canopy, and residue reduce evaporation rate. Maximize that plant diversity with saline tolerant vegetation um, to get anything growing in there so that we can um, not be evaporating that water and that water is actually going through the plant, uh, roots up through the plant, um, lose it through evapotranspiration, not uh, trans uh, evaporation on the soil surface. Living roots throughout the year, uh, restore all soil life and use all your water use water throughout the whole growing season, not just um, in the middle part uh, in the summer, and integrate livestock. And really integrating livestock, many producers will ask, why do we need to do that? Well, you need to do it. Need might be, might be a strong word, but in my opinion, it's the best way to make these acres economical and make it uh, fit to a producer's uh, pocketbook better. So uh, these are just a couple of pictures. Jim showed some great examples. Um, your photo on the right there is a stereo rye that was planted. Now, cereal rye has got some pretty good salt tolerance, but you can see here um, that it doesn't quite grow in those really hot saline areas, but it's using water and it grows early in the spring, which is what we need. And then the picture on the right is showing an alfalfa and wheatgrass um, mixture that was planted into some salt tolerant air, into some salt areas. And you'll see that the, the alfalfa kind of gets a little thin throughout the salt areas, but the wheatgrass is able to establish and eventually spreads out and covers the whole soil surface and starts to restore acres. So with that, I am not gonna to take too much more of your time. If you've got any comments or questions for me, I'd love to love to answer them. There's my contact information, kent.vlieger at usda.gov. Um, and if you get a hold of me that way, then I would love to give you my work cell phone also. So with that, I'll pass it back to Jim or Anthony. Thanks everyone. Great, thank, thank, thank you, Kent. That that uh, that was excellent. Um, so we're we're setting the stage um, for basically every acre counts. And while I bring up my PowerPoint here, there it is. Um, uh, this process that we're talking about of of removing these uh, what we're talking about is marginal lands. Removing these marginal lands from from crop production and, and every acre counts uh, was uh, developed just to help you do that. And uh, uh, you heard uh, talk about precision data. Kent gave that example there. Uh, Evan uh, mentioned uh, the acres and the Agtegra network uh, affected by salts and, and we're using precision techniques uh, to um, to, to identify those acres. And so Every Acre Counts is a program to, to assist you to do that. In fact, yesterday at the DIRT conference, um, the first producer panel that they had, uh, that question came up about precision profitability analysis. And, and uh, two of the three were, were doing it already. So I, this, is, this is a coming uh, 
uh, practice. I think you're going to see more and more of this precision profitability analysis, and Every Acre Counts is, is here to help you get that started. That, that's our desire to get that started. Okay, got to get my slides to advance. The primary partners for Every Acre Counts were the Second Century Habitat Fund, uh, USDA NRCS, and SDSU Extension. I want to talk about the picture first um, here. This is the example of, of what we see uh, uh, happening because of the, the work that we would do through Every Acre Counts or th through, through just doing it like, like Kent demonstrated there. Um, you can do this on your own. Um, you know, our, our purpose is to, to educate and, and to get, get, some, get some research data, uh, examples, if you will, just the examples, uh, and, and to promote this throughout South Dakota. And so this is a perfect example, this picture is showing exactly uh, how, how, to how this is demonstrated. So the program directors for Every Acre Council are myself and Dr. Matt Dearson. Uh, here's our contact information. Um, don't hesitate to get a hold of us if you have questions or want to have a producer or are you are a producer that wants to get in on the Every Acre Counts program. We have recently hired uh, Kristen Weber. Uh, she is our precision ag and conservation specialist. Uh, her position is shared between um, Pheasants Forever and, and SDSU. Uh, through grants that we received from Purina Pet Care and USDA, uh, the NRCS. You'll be hearing from Kristen in a little bit. She's going to talk to you about the process, and um, and uh, we're really happy to have her on board. She's she's really the got got a rich history in uh, precision farming uh, data and analysis and writing scripts and looking at imagery and and all of that stuff. I've learned so much from her already and, and really look forward to learning a lot, lot more. So really the goal of, of Every Acre Counts is just to, you know, improve profitability through diversity and, and improve ecosystem benefits on the farm while taking advantage of our precision technologies. And you've heard and seen those examples already. And so, um, you know, the precision profitability analysis is just, used to identify those marginal areas. Uh, we can go out, we can see them as well. And, and we've done that. Uh, there's other programs uh, that have addressed that. If, if we've looked at those areas and we can, you know, we can see them. So let's put this corner of this field in a program or just plant it to grass, uh, we can do that. But what precision profitability analysis does is helps us draw a line, a line where we're more comfortable with uh, having that, that break between the cropland and, and those areas that are seeded back to grass. So the outcomes we would, you know, we want are this information is available to producers. And as Kent, as Kent gave in his presentation, you know, it's all about investing money in the land and getting a return. And so this will be enhanced through this type of practice uh, that, that we're trying to educate about. So removing those marginal lands from crop, crop production increases, increases that profitability. So how are we gonna do this? Well, we need, we need producers, obviously. And that's where companies like Eggtegra comes in. Uh, Evan shared that data and how they're going out and doing that in the field. And so we need your help. Uh, it's a partnership and uh, to locate those producers. So we need their records as I have listed there in number two, and we're gonna use uh, precision software um, to do that profitability analysis and locate and identify those marginal lands. We're gonna give producers an idea of what they should plant in these areas because the salty soils are really our focus, but there are other examples of marginal lands too in other parts of South Dakota, whether it be the marginal wetlands or the eroded uh, hillsides in some of our hillier landscapes. We want to assess that uh, profitability after we've converted some of these areas to, to make sure that we've had that positive impact on the farm. Um, and there's other programs as well. It's just not about the Every Acre Counts program, um, which I'm going to explain a little bit later. Uh, there's the 
Soil Health and Habitat Program that Pheasants Forever has. There's the uh, Second Century Habitat Program, uh, which is very similar to Every Acre Counts. And of course, there's CRP. CRP may be the option, and that's okay. We, we're, not, uh, um, we're not stuck on one program. And of course, we wanna share these successes with other producers. We want this to become a normal process of, of, uh, of assessing your land's capability and, and the, the profitability on the landscape and, and identifying the fact that some of these acres maybe just shouldn't be in cropland production. And we wanna monitor the effects of, of this conversion on soil health and water quality. And, th and this won't be done everywhere. Um, that we have these acres, but in a few selected sites. Of course, in the end, we wanna de develop case studies that summarize this impact. And then we wanna show policymakers uh, what's, what's happening in South Dakota so that they can take this to neighboring states and other, other places and, and, and share it with them as well. So of course, I've talked about improving on-farm profitability. Uh, the level of insurance company insurance coverage on those remaining acres really is affected in a positive way. And so when there is a disaster and a payment needs to be made, that, that level of protection is increased because we've removed those acres that would normally drag that average down. Of course, I talked about soil health and water quality, but wildlife habitat is really big as well. And that's a heritage in South Dakota that uh, everyone knows. And not everyone is a hunter, but it's important for our lifestyle and our society in South Dakota. We have a class on campus that's been working in this process as well. So we're starting with students and hopefully as they get out and work for agronomic firms that they will understand this process as well and take that with them. So it's a working lands concept is really what, what we're promoting that has a lot of flexibility because um, we want that. To, we want landowners and producers to understand that that um, that they can do some things with these areas that uh, you wouldn't normally do. And in the end, we're decreasing re, um, reliance on farm program funding, um, such as the subsidies and the insurance. And that goes a long way with our stakeholders and the confidence that they have in their food production system. And I think you see and know about those examples that we have in society. And uh, we need to do whatever we can to, to make a positive influence on that. So it's, it's winning all around. And, you know, Jim mentioned the winning and, and I, I just, it's a very positive way to uh, manage our landscapes. So Every Acre Counts was in only 15 counties uh, when it first started, but it, it has gone statewide now. And that was effective in July of this last year. So. Um, again, the marginal lands that we're talking about are salty soils, wetlands, and eroded soils. So the details of the Every Acre Counts program Excel. You know, we have the precision profitability analysis part. Uh, and if a producer wants us to do that, or uh, you have a producer in the Ag Tegra system that wants that process, there's no ob obligation to go any further with any type of program. But there are some programs that we'd like to offer to help get some of these uh, marginal lands converted. And every acre count is an example of that. Of course, I mentioned soil health and habitat program with pheasants. I mentioned the second century habitat fund and I mentioned CRP. So whatever, whatever program really fits the farmer is what we want them to choose. But every acre counts has $150 acre incentive payment. Uh, that is uh, for five years of the program. Uh, we, we use the precision data, identify those marginal lands, uh, but in the end, the producer decides how much land they want to enroll. Uh, no one but them draws those lines uh, where they want uh, that conversion to take place. Through the Every Acre Counts program, um, there is a $50 per acre um, payment for the seed and the seeding of those acres. So. Um, I just want to know that that money is limited right now. So the first uh, producers in the program that want to enter some land will be the first ones considered for that money. So um, that's important to get in on that early. Uh, there's no easements required in this program. Um, it is a working lands focus, as I mentioned. 
grazing is allowed all year long, um, unlike CRP. So if these producers have livestock and they, you know, they graze their corn stalks, uh, they don't need to fence these areas. Their livestock can have access. Um, harvesting the forage is permitted, but we'd like we want to restrict that to only times outside of the primary nesting season. That's probably the biggest uh, restriction that every acre counts has is that, that, that harvesting of the forage. And hunting is not regulated. There's no agreement that you have to let hunters on. You still control your land the way you always have. And there's um, no obligation. I just, I just wanna say that we wanna have the chance to do that precision profitability analysis for you. And uh, we provide a nice report when that is done. And then it's up, up to the producer. Um, how much or any land they want to put in the program. Some may decide to just do something on their own and, that, and that's fine too. We just want to kickstart this process. So Kristen is going to take over and talk about the next few slides on, on how we do this process. Thanks, Anthony. Um, so the software we are using with Every Acre Counts is Fieldalytics. Um, with this program, we can connect to climate and John Deere platforms directly to bring the data in, or we can manually upload uh, covering a broad spectrum of monitors. You want to go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, after the harvest files are transferred in, I do review each of the files to check for inconsistencies and missing data. Um, and so with the yield data that's usable, I run the normalized yield analysis to create a percent of average yield. So this layer is then turned into the yield potential map based on the numbers that the grower gives us for his farm. And then when the production costs are entered, the, the final profit map right there on the end is created. Let me go to the next one. Okay, thanks. Um, to get to the profit map, this is the information that we need. So the template on the right is the basic format in Fieldalytics, but it can um, be more detailed per category by breaking out equipment costs per se to planting and harvest or splitting the fertilizer costs down to the nutrient cost per acre. Um, also, if you have the variable rate application maps for seed and fertilizer, this software can overlay that data to the right acre versus having to do just a blanket cost. Uh, the field report card that we call it, which is not on this slide, but within that report, it shows you the field yield, uh, profitability distribution, return on investment, yield increase needed to break even, and expense reduction needed to break even, which are all based on this information. And that's in the final reports that we give to the grower. Um, so with this information, we run different scenarios on different crops. We adjust the yields to a higher potential than what the grower gives us. And we also look at potential future crop prices so that we can pinpoint those marginal acres just across the board um, that need to be managed differently or completely removed to increase that ROI or reduce the, the risk on those acres. So whether the decision is to completely remove the acres or adapt different fertilizing strategies, uh, there's always a positive change in helping protect the natural resources. Um, the grower has the opportunity to redistribute those input dollars to a more profitable um, areas on his farm. And then overall, just like Kent uh, mentioned in his presentation, increasing the overall yield average in the field. So the next slides are an example created by SDSU students um, that Anthony was going to kind of go through on those. Yeah, I, I briefly mentioned uh, in one of my slides that we're even doing this on campus with a, a class of students, upperclassmen. And uh, we identified a producer um, um, just in uh, Kingsbury County and, um, and they worked on this quarter section of land that you see highlighted on the left and the soils are on the right. And you can see uh, uh, considerable wetland down the middle of this quarter. What they did is they did the profitability analysis and uh, found uh, uh, the areas in the field that were unprofitable. And you can see it's, it's, it's along that wetland area, of course, um, and in the southwest corner of that field. 
So what they propose to the producer is to put some buffer strips in and uh, you can see there's some straight lines there. And so they made, uh, they worked with the producer to develop those lines to, to make it fit his equipment better. And, and that's what I tell producers in every acre counts is let's draw those lines where they fit your sprayer or they fit your planter or, or let's make it convenient for you because this is your chance to do that. And so, so you can see how they've drawn some of these lines and, and I, I think they've done a good job at that. So the analysis of before and after comparison, you can see that the average yield has increased uh, seven or eight bushels per acre. The profit has gone up, and of course that's affected the return on investment. And the break-even price has gone down, and, that, and that's good for marketing. Uh, we know that uh, we can set that, that bar a set level, and so we have a better chance of making a profit. And of course, the total profit for that field has gone from a negative uh, number to a positive number. So lastly, I, I want to show you some actual fields that we've done. I'm not going to tell you where they're at, whose they are, uh, because I want you to know that we practice a high level of, of professional confidentiality in this program. Um, there's only three uh, people that will see the actual data, the raw data from this program. Um, the only way that we will share this data is in a, in a fashion like this. and 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 more likely, most likely it will be aggregate data. So it will be combined data with other producers and it won't be individual fields like this. But uh, these are these these 11 fields are real fields. Um, just wanted to show you, got the acres there and, and what, what we've done is split out the profit or loss categories and what percent of the field is in those categories. And you can see we found a considerable a number of, of acres in the lost category. And uh, ranging from, you know, 3% uh, up to 21%. So depending upon the field, and of course this is affected by soil type and the marginal problems that we have that I shared with you, um, that will control that. So not every field is the same. And, and as agronomists, you know that. I, I know you know that. I've talked to agronomists that have shared that with me. And uh, a few of those agronomists have shared the fact that, yeah, some of their clients, they have tried to convince them to give up fields or give up parts of fields because they just continually a drag on the operation. But in these 11 fields, those areas that are losing money amounted to about $73,000 of crop inputs. Um, and if, you know, that's, that's real money back to the farm. So, um, so it's a big impact and can have a big impact. So uh, precision profitability analysis is real and um, it's something that uh, uh, everyone should be doing that has, has the data to do it. So in summary, you know, Every Acre Counts is trying to bring a consensus uh, among agricultural groups and conservation organizations and we need that right now. Uh, we need that in a big way. Uh, Marginal lands are set aside and not farmed. And, and then that's important. It's a win-win-win for, for all of those groups, including non-farmers. And if we can share that message with our urban stakeholders, uh, they will uh, get a, a really good positive uh, uh, feeling about what we're doing out on the land. So the environmental benefits are huge. Uh, wildlife habitats increased and improved. Again, that crop risk coverage is increased with less reliance on taxpayer dollars, uh, which are, you know, they're stakeholders and they know, know these things. Of course, on-farm profitability greatly improved and our stakeholder acceptance of what we do uh, greatly increased. So with that, um, uh, that concludes our webinar for today. I want to share with you um, our current partners that we have. Uh, of course, we have the Soil Health Coalition in South Dakota Corn. Uh, we have Pheasants Forever, Ducks Unlimited, and South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. And Perina Pet Care and Egg Tigger are our, our recent additions, and we're so happy to have them on board. Uh, we need everybody's help with this process because we're really trying to change a land management paradigm, and a paradigm is just a normal way we look at things. 
And uh, if we can change that and, and uh, um, cause that to occur across the landscape, but it has a lot of potential benefits. So with that, I'd like to thank all the presenters that uh, helped out with this today. Um, Jim and Evan and Kent and Kristen, uh, thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, I don't know if we have any questions in the Q&A or not, but I'm sure Lindsay or Matt will, will let us know. I'm not seeing any right now, Anthony, but if anyone wanted to add some, now would be a good time. It would be a great time. Um, I'll just, if you have, um, if you want to uh, contact us, uh, you know, feel free to contact us. And we did record this this webinar. I, I know that there is uh, a few that want to watch it later. So uh, we will make that available. Lindsay, how, how would you suggest that I make that, that link available? We can email the link to everyone that was registered and um, we'll provide it to your team so that you can also share it through email and social media for anyone else who's interested. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll be taking care of that. And uh, if you don't see that link, uh, uh, just find me and uh, um, on online and email me or call me. Um, I shared my, um, my contact information. I should probably go back to that. I don't know, it might take too many clicks to get back to that screen, but uh, um, either Kristen or Matt Dearson or myself or Jim Ristow or anybody is con connected with Every Acre Counts. So don't be afraid to reach out to anyone and they will they will be probably be happy to connect you with the right people. Jim, there's a question in the Q&A for you. I'm gonna unmute. Do you, do you have me? Yes. Okay, uh, the question was, I think asked earlier and I, I responded, I didn't realize I didn't respond publicly and I didn't intend it, but that, that was, the question was about, uh, can you manage salinity through the vegetation uh, removal and regrowth? I, th I think that's uh, where this is going. And and uh, it's difficult. Kent might be have a better handle on how to answer this, but in my mind, you know, it what what the issue is is evaporating water, and that's bringing that saline content with the water. And even though you took residue away. Uh, the water is always bringing in a fresh saline from a fresh source because the water is moving up, down, sideways, every direction. So I think the key to really impact is to limit the amount of that evaporation and that is through plants. So Kent, do you have anything to add? No, I think you nailed it, Jim, I guess if, if part of the question is, can you remove the salt through the vegetation through haying or grazing? Uh, short answer is no. Uh, they're very minimal salt uptake and any amounts that there are, I would, uh, I heard someone talk about it would take hundreds of years to remove that salt. But Jim nailed it as that salt is a pretty constant source and you have to get rid of <clears throat> that evaporation. That's kind of the first step. You want that water to move down with rainfall instead of the predominant movement being up through capillary action. So, I'd like to add a, a little bit as well. Um, the last slide I have has that picture on it again. And, um, you know, it shows uh, more land than just the problem area uh, uh, converted back to perennial vegetation. And it's important to lower the water table in that area. And so Jim uh, mentioned the prairie using water from um, the beginning of the growing season to the end and how important that was. And that's kind of, that's the problem we're having is we're only using water in, in June, July and August and the other months of the year accumulating that water and the water tables are rising. Now, granted, we've had way too much precipitation, but if we get back into some more normal years, 
this vegetation can help lower that water table and those salts, give those salts a chance to move back down into that profile where they came from. Someone is raising their hand, debunker. How do we handle that, Lindsay? I've turned on the microphone so they can talk and ask a question. Okay, debunker, you were, I saw you first and then there's one more we'll get to. Turn on your mic, debunker. Um, right now he's still muted. Um, so we can wait just a couple minutes. And while we're waiting, there is a new question in the Q&A. Okay. I'll, read, I'll just read the question for those that can't see it. What is your overall opinion on tile improving these problem areas? Can you touch again on what soil char characteristics that will improve with tile and others that will degrade with tile? Jim or Kent want to go first? Yeah, I can start off, Jim, if you want to fill in any gaps that I miss when I'm done. Um, so yeah, a tile certainly can potentially improve um, some of these saline acres. And Jim touched on, I think most of us touched on, it's a high water table is really what's causing this. And so as that water table moves closer to the surface, it's easier for it to, um, easier and faster for it to get to the soil surface through capillary action. Um, so if you were to lower that water table, then yes, it'd obviously be more difficult for that water to rise to the surface through capillary action. Um, I will throw, throw a caveat on, on some of this though is, yes, I, I acknowledge tile can help, but there are certain fields, and that's I think what part of your question is, there are certain soils where if you have a sodic soil or it's saline and sodic, um, you really need to do more investigation on where those, so where that sodium's coming from, where it is in the soil profile. Um, if it's saline and sodic, you know, to what extent both or what ratio they are, there's a lot involved. Um, and Jim talked about where if you've got a saline sodic soil and you were to tile it, then those salts or the saline part would more quickly flush through the system and get out of there. And then it would just leave you with just the, the, the sodic or the sodium part. And why that matters is because those salts are actually helping to keep the soil aggregated. And when you remove those salts quickly, then you have nothing but the sodium um, and it disperses the soil, like Jim said, and then you're left with a very tight soil that's hard for water to move through. Um, so those are the things that need to be investigated. Um, something else to consider is that water can move through capillary action in a lot of our soils in South Dakota, uh, six to eight feet. So even if your water table is at, at six feet, for example, and you put your tile in at three or four feet, um, even if that towel does help to lower the water table a little bit, that water through capillary action can still rise past the tile because it's not free water. It's not gravity held water that's going to flow into that tile. So it can really, sometimes it can even bypass that tile through capillary action, still make it to the soil surface. So I, I just encourage producers to do your homework. Um, take a lot of tests, find someone that's worked with saline and sodic soils and see if that's really gonna benefit you because it's a big investment. Um, and if it is, then that might be your best option. Um, and if, if not, then you're, you're gonna have to go other routes management wise. So um, Jim or Anthony, you guys have anything to add? Yes, I'd, I'd like to, a very good Kent. Um, I almost didn't say anything because you covered it so well, but um, I, I would also, um, encourage you to get educated about how a tile system works and, and the importance of a good outlet and a good slope on your tile drainage system. And a, a lot of our fields um, may not have that. In fact, there are probably some limiting layers in these soils in the Jim River Valley that are conducive to internal drainage. And that what I mean is the water moving within the soil itself. Um, our high clay content soils uh, which the glacial till is because of that shale parent material that Jim talked about, 
uh, doesn't have very good drainage. And so um, to really be effective, you know, it, 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 it's a higher cost than what a normal tile system would cost. And so that's just what I'm saying is, 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 is reiterating what Kent said about getting educated and talk to people that have done it and know what they're doing. And uh, uh, don't go out on your own and try to make this work because uh, um, those soils are very, very tough to take care of. We have another question, um, unless Jim wants to add to the first one. I think you guys yeah. covered it well. Okay, I'll move on to the next question. But Would I, will, corn... I will respond to the second question. Okay, can I read it? Is I'll read it for those that can't see it. Maybe everybody can see it and I'm, I'm just out, but would corn on corn be a better rotation and take the soybeans out of the rotation? So um, there's nothing wrong with corn. There's nothing wrong with soybeans. Uh, corn is a high carbon to nitrogen ratio crop. So you're gonna get a lot of residue. There's a lot, there's a lot of carbon left with corn residue. Uh, soybean is a high nitrogen use crop or nitrogen content crop. So the residues just don't stay around very long because there's not as much carbon in that residue. And, and it's more uh, nitrogen, which the microbes love. You know, we all know soybean residue disappears rather quickly if you have a good biologically active soil. So what we're talking about is leaving residues. Uh, corn on corn would likely leave more residues, but don't do that at the expense of diversity because you end up tilting your microbial community in one direction. And this, this gets complex. There's, I mean, we're trying to manage biology really through our rotation. And, and what we're finding is the more diverse, the better. So uh, Dwayne Beck has done a lot of work with this. He's looking at incorporating perennials into his rotation to manage this water table in, in these uh, you know, areas like the James River Valley where we're seeing the issues. And, and he suggests that soybeans about one in five years well, that's, that's uh, and maybe even with, you know, into residues or using things like companion crops or cover crops. It can be done, but our 50-50 is, is gonna leave us with bare soils. And that, that's really just gonna leave our soils at risk. So, you know, corn on corn, uh, then maybe your beans would be better than 50-50, now you're two thirds. But, but we really should be looking at about uh, a, an 80% high carbon rotation. Wheat could play a role. Wheat and cover crops certainly could pay, you know, a nice role. You know, we, gotta, we got economics to worry about too, I get it. But, uh, you know, perennials could play a role. Alfalfa can play a role. Uh, so, He's just worked on some uh, rotations. I suggest you check out Dakota Lakes. Dwayne will talk to you about salinity and water use. It's really water use and, and matching your rotation with the climate we have. Very good, thank you, Jim. Kent, would you have anything to add or? Uh, you know, nothing really too much. Um, I agree with what Jim said. I think there are ways uh, management wise where, you know, especially focused on the saline sodic topic like we are today that, um, you know, soybeans are just, they don't really start using much water until, you know, even probably later than, than corn and they don't use as much um, in general as corn. So water use issue, there's, there's some drawbacks there with soybeans, but they're an important agronomic crop. And there are ways that we can change our management to, um, you know, to really make a more of a diverse rotation, have more different types of plants out there. You know, there's a lot of producers now looking at um, planting soybeans into, into cereal rye. 
and that serialize a high, higher carbon crop like Jim was mentioning. So there's ways to add carbon into that management and still have those soybeans be a big part of your rotation. Um, yeah, certainly there's, there's ways we can change management um, to, use, to use more water throughout the year in those saline acres. Okay, I think uh, I, I'm not gonna add anything to that. I think they did an excellent job answering that question. So we had debunker Samuel and, and Arlene Brandt Jensen that uh, were raising their hands. Um, um, is there still a, a question or a comment? No specific questions that I can see. Okay. Well, if, if that, uh, can, I thank you for the discussion. There's some really good, great questions. Um, and uh, um, thank you for attending today. Again, we'll have, uh, have the uh, recording of this available for those that could not attend. I, I know we had a lot more registrations than, than attendance today. And so um, we'll, we'll get that out as soon as we can. So again, thanks a lot. and. Um, um, I think this will conclude our webinar for today. <laughs>